okay. I think we're going okay. Uh, well, I was just saying that uh, I'm, I'm glad you guys are back. And uh, I spent the day grading 1.4s and I'm very pleased with what I saw. Everybody that turned in their stuff on time, uh, I was very happy with it. Those of you that couldn't get it done by Sunday night, I gave you an extension till Wednesday. Uh, in uh, this first month, we're just gonna be a little more lenient, um, but know that the full sale pace is something that is very relentless and you got to get used to that rhythm. You've got to get that rhythm inside you if you want to make it through the whole long haul. So think of this first month as an on-ramp. We're getting up to speed and, and if you can't quite make it, you know, there's no, no reason to, uh, you know, uh, worry about it. It's just month one, but later on you are going to be expected to get the uh, stuff be able to done in, in, in the time allotted and, and uh, I want you to strive for that. So uh, all this month, we're going to practice a little bit of forgiveness. If you're having trouble meeting the deadline, get a hold of me. I can give you an extension. Uh, but uh, know that the goal is to just get up to speed, get into the rhythm of the classes so that you can get things going. And uh, of the papers that I got, I was very pleased. Most of them were really good. You guys had a lot of good insight. You guys uh, followed the formats. I know I asked a lot of you, you know, a lot of steps in there in that first piece. And, uh, you know, the reason for that was just basically to see how well you guys can read instructions and so forth. So um, this is not a class where we're going to make you jump through hoops or, or do much more writing after this. From, from here on, you're being very creative. And so I want to uh, talk about uh, the assignments this week and uh, get you guys set up. Uh, the reading this week, we, we've switched, we're switching gears from Resonate, we're going to start reading from Slideology. And I hope you guys are having okay time accessing the books in O'Reilly. I know that there, there have been some issues, but uh, anybody that's having problems getting a hold of the book or being able to, to read it in the format of any sort, get a hold of me. I have a number of workarounds and uh, one way that I make sure that you can, you can get the reading done. Uh, so this week, we have several chapters from Slideology that we want to uh, uh, talk about. And the theme of this week is preparation. So we are planning to make our main presentation. And so this week, I'm going to give you the topic and we're going to talk about the assignment for this week, which is the, the plan for that presentation. No one's making a presentation, their main presentation this week. We're making the plan for it. But there's also uh, a really fun assignment in the discussion board uh, and uh, it's a media assignment. So that's gonna have a feeling like you're making a presentation this week anyway. So uh, you'll, you'll have plenty of chance to uh, be creative and, and make media. Um, but, uh, and, and uh, I still have yet to grade this week, last week's discussions. I'll get those grades out tomorrow, but uh, I wanna make sure everybody had their uh, feedback on the, the main assignment. That's what you spent a lot of time on and, and, and it, uh, the effort that you put in shows. So I'm very pleased with that. So among the reading that um, we're asking you to do this week uh, is Nancy's first attempt to, to kind of define a cosmology of what presentations can do. And that was a chapter called The Five Theses to the Power of Presentation. That was her first starting to think about presentations and, and, you know, what are they good for? And uh, um, she came up with these simple answers. Uh, and you're going to see it in the reading, but the, the, the gist is one thing we already have heard, the audience is the hero. The audience is the king. Uh, the next one is that presentations are really great for spreading ideas, for making things viral. You can have a chance to move people and spread ideas. So presentations are really great for having an idea and spreading it forward, planting, in, planting that seed in other people's heads to make something go viral. Uh, presentations need multi uh, media, uh, pictures and video, video especially helps. So uh, you use your words to tell a story, you use the multimedia to give an impact, to help them see what you're saying. This is a very visual medium. And so uh, while your words have great import and the way what you say and how you say it matters, the way that you shape the visual part of the presentation is gonna determine whether people really 
hang in there and stay with your presentation and get engrossed in it and feel like it, it sweeps them away. So we want to learn to, to use visuals to the best advantage of what you have to say. To that end, slides are there to communicate. We're practicing design, not decoration. We're not just making pretty pictures. We wanna use pictures that count. And that's basically why I had you add imagery to your papers this uh, week. Uh, the, for the most part, you did choose wise images, images that helped me understand what the TED Talk was about or what the performer was doing. Uh, you know, it really did enhance what was going on. And so you want to give people as much help in visualizing your words as you can. And that's uh, a, a design job, not um, uh, just picking something you like. And uh, finally, cultivate healthy relationships. In presentations, there are different relationships that go on. If you're presenting live, there's a relationship between the presenter and the audience, and you have the opportunity to read the audience. And if you're starting to explain yourself and they seem puzzled, then maybe you can kind of pick that vibe up and be uh, a little more emphatic in explaining your concept. Or they're listless, then maybe you want to amp up your own energy in order to make them a little more excited. You have the ability to what we call read the room, read the audience, and uh, supply what they're missing. Now, we're not doing live performances, so that aspect of uh, relationships in a presentation isn't something we're gonna actually uh, be, deal with. But even in pre-recorded presentations like we're gonna make, there is a, uh, a dialogue that happens between the audio, your voiceover, and the slides. It's a kind of conversation that's going on. You're speaking words and these slides are putting up information and the audience is interpreting why that information is there. And it should become obvious. It should help them to understand what you're saying. And the more confusing those visuals are, or the more off topic they are, the more that, the louder that conversation becomes and, and, and it, it distracts from your message. So you wanna have a great relationship between the slides and the, and the voiceover. You want it to feel like they really are working hand in glove, they are, uh, a team messaging the same information. So uh, another part of what you're gonna be reading this week, and this is important, is Nancy's note, uh, um, idea about what it takes to make a presentation in its entirety. As I mentioned last week, the main mistake most people make when they start to do a presentation is they start at the end, they start with the slides and try to work their way backwards. So once you've got a couple of slides you like, you then maybe come up with a commentary that fits it uh, as if you're in service of the slides. And that's an incorrect way to work. So we want to get you guys in the proper path of working. And so what Nancy has presented in, in, in some of the reading I'm giving you this week is uh, a notation of what the workflow for creating a presentation is all about. And uh, we're all very familiar with sort of the uh, Hollywood movie uh, ecosystem, which is neatly divided into pre-production, production, and post-production. And this goes back before modern times to the, uh, the film days of ma movie making in Hollywood. And those were three distinct phases. So in pre-production, that's where all the planning gets done. In the pre-production, you write the script, you cast the actors, you, you hire the crew, you build the sets, you know, uh, you, you plan everything out. You figure, uh, you do an awful lot of budgeting and, and, and time management. Because uh, in, in movie making, production, uh, production is very expensive. You've got all these people who've come together and of course, uh, if they're getting paid, then then that's huge salaries going out to uh, you know actors and production talent who've all gathered together to make this thing. So you want to be as efficient as possible. So the way that you make production efficient is that you have pre-production, plan everything out meticulously so that the the days are full and everything's done 
uh, in, in a correct timing so that, you know, if, if it's going to take longer for one set to be built, then you plan that at the end of production and, and you're never doing any waiting around. You're never uh, at a loss for, uh, for time in production. And so production, you're filming. And in the old days, we actually used film in the cameras. And the reason that that mattered is that uh, you couldn't ever tell until you actually had developed the film and looked at it the very next day. They called it looking at dailies, whether you'd gotten everything you needed. And if you'd actually made a mistake the day before, then you had to go in back into the planning and plan reshoots. Uh, and then finally, once you got all the shooting done, post-production was a, a, another light phase where you could get rid of all the cast and send everybody away and you just squirrel away into an editing room and you put the film together, you work on the, 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 the music and the audio track and you know whatever publicity and whatnot you're working on. But post-production is uh, just an assembly period. And um, that is still the process by which movies are made today. What makes them very, uh, what makes it kind of confusing is that in a digital age, it all happens in one, the same spot. It all happens in your computer. So whereas in the Hollywood days, these were different job functions and different offices and different locations. And you could really cleanly divide up those division of duties. In the modern era, uh, you write the script and you, 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 you cast the actors and you do all the pre-production work on your laptop. And then you, when you go into filming, you're often uh, recording straight to, um, to, to the computer. Uh, I'm recording this lecture right now and I'm recording it straight to the computer. Uh, the computer is not just a pre-production tool, it becomes a tool of making art, making video, making production uh, in conjunction with the camera. Uh, and, and if you're shooting yourself on a webcam, then even the camera disappears. Your computer even becomes the camera itself. And then post-production, Everything is edited and assembly, assembled in software on the laptop. So that while in the old days, these three phases were neatly separated, um, nowadays it can be kind of confusing because you may actually be working on the music and some of the fi finishing elements uh, in the same time that you're writing a script and you can be doing it all. But the problem is that you need to keep these phases clear in your mind so that you're cleanly working through the work process. It's a, it's a matter of, of going through the steps properly. It's kind of like flying an airplane. When you fly an airplane, before you take off, you need to go through your, your flight checklist. And if you don't do that every time, if you don't make that a habit, you're going to forget something important. And the same thing happens working digitally. If you just try to keep it all in your head, and you think, oh, well, it'll come to me. Or you're going to forget something important or you won't remember it until it's too late and there's no reason you can't just have a little more organization in your process. So what Nancy uh, Duarte has done for us with presentations is she's looked at that process for filmmaking which basically holds for uh, video game design and lots of other production types and she's made a model for what it takes to make a presentation. And I wanna take a little bit of time and go through that. It's basically three legs. Instead of production, pre-production, production, and post-production, she has defined that it is message, track, visual track, visual story, and delivery. These are the three avenues that you have to figure out and you work on as you're going through. And each of those have component elements. And I wanna take a little bit of time and go through these component elements because it is very important to work through these things in stages, in the correct stage, so that you don't forget something important on your checklist. So as we've said time and again in the message track, the very first thing to figure out is who you're talking to and why. You have to know who your audience is so that you know what you wanna say, so that you can tailor the message to them, so that you can tailor your language to them, so that you can make references that connect with the audience, you want to be able to uh, use um, information and, and evidence and, and jokes and, and uh, memes and, and social references that your audience cling to naturally. 
Um, you know, you don't want to talk hip hop to doctors. You, want to do, you don't want to talk formally to a bunch of third graders. You have to figure out who your audience is, what their language is, and be able to meet them at that level. So uh, one of the most important things for you to do as you decide on the presentation you're making is, who is this for? And uh, a lot of the decisions that you're going to make thereafter flow from that important uh, determination that you make. The next part is ideation. Now this may be a word that you haven't heard before, but it's an incredibly important part of the creative process, not just making presentations, but everything. Um, you may not have heard this word, but it's the sister of a, uh, a word that you have heard, creation. You know what creation is. Creation is the act of creating. And ideation is simply the act of generating ideas. This is such an important word. Why don't we know it? Well, it's been more or less supplanted everywhere by a, um, a metaphor, brainstorming. Brainstorming is a word that we all know, and it means trying to have ideas. Uh, but if you think about it, what does brainstorm mean? It means that somehow the back of your head is a meteorological uh, arena, and uh, you're, you're creating turmoil back there. Well, the mind is a kind of uh, unknown process to us, even still, especially as it regards to generating creative ideas. And we know that when we start to work on a project and we want to generate ideas, that there's a kind of an art to it. It's, uh, you can't go straight at it. You have to kind of um, wait for the muse to speak to you. You have to kind of be inspired. You kind of have to figure out ways to invite the ideas to flow. Some people do it by sketching in a notebook or making notes or just going off and meditating or humming or whatnot. But you can always know that a creative person has a, a particular process they go to towards trying to get ideas to generate. And um, if I can give you one bit of advice that it's gonna make you a better student, a better artist, better uh, creative media employee for the rest of your life, it's that whenever you go into this brainstorming ideation phase, push it a little bit longer than you're used to. Push it a little past your own comfort zone. You know, trying to generate ideas to some extent is like going to Google search. Google search is dead easy. You put in a, a term and you hit return and, and suddenly there are 100,000 results. But we're lazy, we don't look at 100,000 results. And so the person who takes the very first result from Google search, that's the bad artist. That's the person who gives up too soon. So if you're waiting for ideas to come, keep at it. Uh, and in fact, brainstorming is an art. Uh, we're gonna learn some rules for brainstorming because you're gonna create a plan for your presentation this week. And I want you to go through a brainstorming phase. So we're gonna talk about you know, what I want you to do, how I want you to approach it but it's a very important thing. You want to generate lots of ideas, lots of ideas. And the people who stop too soon, the people who are too satisfied with the first or second idea that comes to them are the people that aren't that creative. If you keep at it, you're going to surprise yourself. So that's my, uh, my main bit of advice is that whatever your creative process is, push it a little harder because there are better ideas always or beyond the horizon just waiting to come to you. And once you've generated a lot of ideas, then you go into a writing editing phase. You start throwing out the, the ideas that maybe they're not bad ideas, but they don't fit this particular project. And you're able to collect together a lot of good information and figure out how to craft your story. Remember when we, when we tell the information we want to tell, we want to put it in the form of a story so that it has a beginning, middle, and end. And that means crafting the information in certain ways. It means embellishing certain parts of your story and uh, glossing over other parts of your story. 
you want to tell the whole story, but you don't give everything the same amount of attention. And the art of storytelling is the art of uh, giving the right amount of information, right amount of attention and time to the right details. So as you write your story together, crafting all your different ideas together, you're going to come up with uh, a narrative that you have to speak and that's your voiceover. So uh, turning that into a written script is the next phase after you put your plan together. Now it's not really, um, uh, most of you don't have a process for making plans yet. So when I ask you to create a plan, it's gonna feel unnatural to you. You're gonna resist it because you don't normally do it. You just do this in your head, and move on. But again, like bypassing that checklist, I'm asking you to write this down this time so that maybe you know that you're going through all the right steps and you're gonna feel like you've done the entire process correctly. Uh, you know, if, if it doesn't feel like this is the way you should work, you could move on. And there are a number of different ways that you can put your story together. I mean, lots of people, sometimes they make oral notes that they record. Some people make sketches in their sketchbooks. Some people write scripts. You know, uh, some people work hand in hand with the visual story. But crafting that narrative is a main part of pulling your ideas together and making it a story. And then along with the voiceover that you're creating, the visual story is how you're going to tell the story. And it involves a lot of uh, ideas and preparation ahead of time as well. You have to pick images, you have to pick tones and colors, you have to think about how to craft information together. A lot of times the story you're telling is about information and you've got to explain concepts to people. So you're looking for visual metaphors. Maybe you have to create a metaphor in and of your own. Lots of times uh, with presentations that deal with information, people are making charts and graphs or infographics. And if you're a visual thinker, if you can create models that help other people understand information, that's an incredibly valuable tool. That will make you someone who's going to be employed throughout. So the tools that help you um, work your way towards these visuals, um, sometimes storyboards, uh, sometimes things we call mind maps, ways of putting information together visually. Um, people make sketches. People use whiteboards, post-it notes. Uh, there are a number of ways that, that people work and put their ideas together. And uh, part of your process is to figure out what works for you. Another part of visual thinking is figuring out how to express yourself. You're going to need to choose visuals to accompany your words. And we're gonna work on this uh, this week and we're gonna work on this a little more next week. But coming up with the right visuals is incredibly important because again, just like you could always pick the very first choice on a Google search, you can get lazy and come up with a visual that works, but doesn't really give you um, any advantage. Because again, we want to think about what is the audience going to look, think of what we have to say. And sometimes you're looking to impress that audience. Sometimes that audience is more sophisticated than you. So if you reach into the um, PowerPoint uh, clip art cartoons and come up with a cartoon image of a tree when you're talking about something that needs to have a visual of a tree on your voiceover, that would work. In rumbus terms, you've said tree, we see a tree. But if it's a, a, an image meant for a third grader and you're presenting to an audience that is very visually sophisticated, you have not impressed them. So part of visual thinking, part of thinking of what are the visuals that are gonna accompany your presentation should be about what is your personal style? What, what are the images that not only look great, but say something about you that speak to other people that you're trying to connect with. 
Remember, we're always thinking about who the audience is. So certainly if the audience were, uh, you know, low information audience, then, then the, the simplest visuals are the best. But sometimes you're wanting to, to impress people who are very sophisticated, people who are important. And those people, you know, are going to want to know that you have the visual sophistication to communicate on a high level. And this is your chance to do it. Presentation isn't just get through it quick. It is partly a portfolio of your thinking, of your ideas, of your ability to express yourself. So you want to do that in the most elegant, artistic way that you can. So again, the pre-production is a chance for you to think about what are the kind of images that will look great and make people think, hey, this guy knows his stuff or girl. And again, visual thinking involves infographics and models and those kinds of things. And that's the chance to work that stuff out before it's actually needed in, in the, uh, the context. Uh, in pre-production, you will know when you have to talk about uh, models and ideas and, and, and uh, uh, coming up with uh, metaphors for um, information and data. Uh, graphic design is an important thing to think about. As you're speaking and the slides go by, the slides are supposed to go by fairly quickly. We do not want to hold on the slides. There's a rule of thumb I'm going to give you, which is that no single slide should be on the screen for more than 20 seconds. No matter what the slide is, it shouldn't be on the screen for more than 20 seconds. That will slow down the pace of what you're doing. And sometimes the slides will be on for less than a second or two. They go by very fast. And if they do, then they have to be readable very quickly. You don't want to show something very complicated and then have it taken away and have people wondering what they just saw. That, that takes them out of the rhythm of listening to your voice. So one thing we can do is look at graphic design. I know you're not all graphic designers, but in the modern world, we've all been messaged to 10,000 times. And we know what works and doesn't work. We know what graphic design does and what it offers. And, uh, and in terms of being able to create slides that can be read very quickly and uh, therefore don't, don't have to be on the screen in a whole, a whole lot of time, um, I, would, I would ask you to think about driving down the highway. If you're on a big highway, you might be going down 60, 70, sometimes 80 miles an hour. You're going down the highway very fast. And sometimes there's signage on the side of the road that you really need to know. This is where the turnoff is. You know, th uh, this is, you know, this is what you have to do right now. And you better be able to read that sign in a very short amount of time. It can't be complicated. So think about the signage on the side of the road. It's usually big uh, words with good contrast between the background and the foreground, thick weights on the typefaces so that people can read them and grasp them very quickly. You don't want to create confusion. And I know a lot of you, when you make PowerPoint slides, you want to create photo collages. You think that's terrific. I mean, sure, in high school, make as many high photo collages as you want. But don't take six images and lay them on top of each other and then hold that slide on for a minute. That doesn't work in terms of visual pacing. Much better to give each slide, each of those six photographs, its own time and move from slide to slide. You're giving the audience a chance to uh, grasp that information quicker and you're creating visual pace. So, and, uh, and don't do a lot of the mistakes that we see people writing text over photographs without contrast so that you can't see it. So again, graphic design tells us that if I wanna put black type over a black wall, I better put you know, a, round, a, a, a white circle behind it so it gives it some contrast. If I didn't have this white circle here, I doubt any of you could be able to read the words graphic design against this black background. And the same goes when you put thin red type over photographs. It's impossible to read. So uh, think about the audience. Think about the fact that 
your slide's gonna be on screen for a short period of time, and you need to be able to let them understand it and move on very quickly to stay in with the, vo with the, uh, the voice information that you have. If you're gonna have multiple images, break them apart, bring them on separately, give people a chance to understand each image. Motion design is important. Now, when I say motion design and you guys start to think about PowerPoint, you're probably gonna think about the gazillion transitions that PowerPoint comes with. They keep adding transitions to PowerPoint because every time there's a new uh, version, I think we're up to version 11 or 12 of PowerPoint. So they feel like every time they, they, they go to a new version number, they have to add some more stuff, you know, to justify the price increase or whatever. So there are a zillion transitions in there, but the transitions are irrelevant. Transitions are things that keep you from looking at your own content. They are things that happen from slide to slide. And really they aren't important. And the more elaborate ones that are fireworks and water flowing and curtains coming in with, with audio and whatnot, those are real distractions. I don't want you using those kinds of things. I want you to use simple transitions, just move from slide to slide, cut, dissolve, move very quickly. Uh, but the kind of graphic design, that I, the motion design that I, I do want you to see is moving in elements. You know, there's probably gonna be some point in your PowerPoint, we don't want you to fill the, fill the PowerPoint completely with text and bullet points, but there may be one slide or two slides that are, where it's very appropriate for you to have five or six different points collected together as bullet points on the same slide. But you might not necessarily wanna bring them all in together at the same time. What happens when you bring in a slide with five bullet points is the audience immediately starts to try to read all five of them and they stop paying attention to your voice as the presenter. And your job with these slides, with syncing these slides, is to keep people in the moment. And it's much easier, it's built into the design of, of slide design so that you might be able to start off with a blank page and bring in point number one as you begin to talk about it. And as you uh, have finished talking about it, start to talk about point number two, that's the moment when uh, the second bullet point moves in. So maybe over the course of 20 seconds, you slide in five or six bullet points and you have three, four seconds or eight seconds between each one coming on. You can sync immediately the bullet point coming in as you begin to talk about it. And the advantage there is that it keeps the audience in the moment. It doesn't get them reading ahead doesn't get them trying to, uh, to see information that, that you haven't talked about yet. So motion design like that is very important. You're leading the audience and you wanna keep them in the moment. So these are the kinds of things that we want you to practice in your uh, presentations. We want you to make your visuals happen in time, in sync with what you're saying. So the visuals have the impact of amplifying, supporting what you have to say. The third leg of the uh, ecosystem is delivery. The circumstances by which presentations happen. And these, we're trying to get you to have a sense, are all over the map. Last week, we watched a bunch of TED Talks. And that is the traditional notion that you have a person standing on a stage in an auditorium speaking to an audience. Uh, that's one type of presentation, certainly is the classical type. Uh, another type that we all know is the business meeting type presentation where maybe you're in a conference room and you're all sitting around a table and there's eight or 10 people at the meeting and you're leading that meeting. Uh, you may run that presentation off your laptop, so you might let, set your laptop on the table and everybody's looking at it or maybe you're running that presentation off of a, a TV that's on the wall in the conference room, but it's a very different type of dynamic because you're much more intimate. You're in, you know, every one of those people in the room, you're talking to them, you're making sure that your words connect to them. Uh, you know, so there are different kinds of live meetings and each of them involve human to human contact. So in that you have your entire presence, your entire human um, communicative tools 
to work with. You have hand gestures, you have eye contact, you have head movement. Uh, you can think about how you stand and what, what you wear. All these things are gonna impact the way the audience is seeing and interacting with you. You wanna be professional and friendly and approachable. Um, in a live presentation, you don't want, I mean, it's often people get nervous. You, you, you're trying to figure out what you have to say. You know, the, the best way to overcome nervousness is just lots of rehearsal, just be prepared but to, to be in the moment. Um, and that means facing the people you're talking to, whether it's a large audience or a small audience, you really do have to connect with them. You have to look them in the eye. Don't ignore them. Don't go into some zone in your head and try to recite something you memorized, but really be there in the room and talk to them. And when we go to pre-recorded presentations, part of what you have to figure out is what is the medium of connection there? and think about the circumstances. Are people seeing it on the same size device that you created it on? Are they seeing it in the same circumstances? If you create a presentation and you put it on YouTube, are they watching it on their phone on the subway, listening on headphones? Are they at home watching it on a computer? Maybe they're watching it on TV. Uh, and if you can't know, then have you designed a presentation that scales up and down for all those circumstances. If you designed it on your computer, you've got a, a, a 13 inch computer and, and the slides look great on your computer, but when they're scaled down to five inches on a phone, do they look the same? Are they still as readable? Have you given enough white space to everything so that as it scales down, it's all clear? When it scales up to um, being on a, a LCD monitor or a projector, uh, is the resolution of the images holding up? Have you chosen low, re low res images that when you blow them up really big, look very pixelized? Um, these are all things that you need to think about because as the creator, you have to in, you have to in pre-production, imagine the circumstances of presentation. You don't just go into these things willy nilly. You're, you're responsible for it, even though you can't necessarily control it. You can control that you know that there are a range of places where people can see your material. So you can start to design for that. You can start to design for the phone, as well as the computer, as well as the monitor, as well as the projector. And look and think about how well your presentation comes across in each venue. And think about future devices that we've yet to start seeing. You know, are we gonna be creating presentations in augmented reality or virtual reality in, in headsets. We're gonna have large interactive monitors that people uh, not only you know, stand next to in a new kind of relationship, but perhaps touch and interact with. You know, there's so much uh, commentary now on iPads and people are so easy to touch iPads that it does change the way people think about interacting with presentations. And these are all things that you're not responsible for, but as a creator, you have to know that change is coming down in, in the future, and you have to be able to design or think about that. You know that resolutions will get higher. TVs have already gone to 4K, and so you know uh, web images that are 200 pixels are gonna look really, really bad on a 4K TV. Uh, and Again, you're not responsible for it, but as an artist, as a creator, you wanna be able to, to think ahead, be prepared. You wanna create a presentation that will grow into the future as technology changes. And the final aspect of delivery is kind of an odd term. Uh, it's traditionally been called paper. A better way is to leave behind because in a digital age, you may not have paper. But the idea is that your presentation exists in time. It's a time arc. Whether it's three minutes or four minutes or 20 minutes, at a certain point, it's gonna end. And at the end, even if you've been successful in persuading your audience of whatever it is you want them to do, hire you, buy your product, join your cause, how can you get them to take a further action unless you've given them a next step to take? 
so many people who make presentations and make really good ones, then uh, like put their phone number or email address or, or web address or something on the very last slide as if that's an actionable item. You can always put that information on the last slide, but I guarantee you when someone's watching a presentation, they don't suddenly uh, pull out their notebook and write that information down. That's gonna be lost after the presentation is over. So what is to leave behind? Well, you have to think about the circumstances of the presentation. In a live presentation, in a live like sales uh, presentation, um, uh, promotion, uh, there might be a brochure that's created that is the same graphic design as, as, the, as the presentation. And when the lights come up, you hand out the brochures or you hand out your business cards. And that's how you continue the conversation. That's how you get the person to say yes. That's how you get the person to take the next step. If you're doing it online, you have to think about what are the circumstances of viewing? Did you put that uh, presentation on a YouTube page? So on that YouTube page, is there a link? Is there a phone number? Is there an email address? Is there some way for them to continue to get a hold of you? The lead behind is very important. What is there external to presentation that allows you, if you're successful with your presentation, get your audience to take the next step? That's something you need to plan out and figure out and, and know wherever you're going. If uh, your presentation is on your own website or it's done as a, a mailer, then you know perhaps it's within the email or it's on your own web page. But you have to think about these things. It's all part of the presentation itself. So that's the ecosystem. At each point along the line, you have the ability to ask yourself relevant questions and make your project better. And remember, there were a lot of steps I just went through. Don't try to keep them all in your head. Make a checklist. As you're doing a presentation, keep asking yourself, have I done this? Have I done this? Have I thought about this? And that is the whole point here. Following this process is gonna make you a better artist because you're not gonna forget the small stuff. You're not gonna have to regret uh, trying to uh, do something after the fact. So uh, I said that they're brainstorming guidelines. Uh, there are actual rules for brainstorming. I want you to do brainstorming as part of the uh, um, plan that you're gonna create. I'm gonna talk about the uh, uh, main presentation for, for the month uh, in a few minutes. But uh, here are the rules for brainstorming. Rule number one, postpone and withhold your judgment of ideas. Don't stop too soon, just keep going. Keep at it, keep generating ideas because you never know which one is gonna be the one that really works for you. You may have ideas that you think work fine, but if you keep going, you often will find one that's better. Can't guarantee it, but um, rarely is idea number one the best choice. You wanna keep going. Rule number two, encourage wild, exaggerated ideas. The reason they call it brainstorming is that you're just supposed to be like creating a, 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 a tempest in the back of your head, that there are all these ideas that are buried in the back of your head and you need to, to force them loose. So it's creating wild, exaggerated ideas that sort of uh, bring out the next idea after that, that is more refined, more usable. Something about, um, free associating, something about coming up with uh, outrageous or, or uh, undoable ideas makes the reverberation of that. Uh, the next idea is, is usually pretty good because it's a reaction to uh, something that you've kind of exaggerated. Rule number three, quantity counts this stage, not quality. So again, generate lots of ideas. Don't quit too early. And in your presentations, I mean, in your, in your plans that you turn into me this week, I want to see evidence of a lot of ideas generated by you. You're gonna be talking about a, top, a topic that you guys know, so you should be able to generate a lot of ideas. And if, some, if a lot of these ideas don't end up going in the final presentation, that's perfectly fine. But I'm not gonna be happy if you don't give me a lot of ideas. Presentation that starts out with too few ideas is like um, a bald guy that has four hairs and he combs them carefully across his head to make it seem like he's got a luscious head of hair. 
everybody can tell that you didn't do enough brainstorming or enough thinking if you didn't talk enough. So at this point, in the early stage, just throw everything out there. It may feel like you're just vomiting it out. It's fine. You're going to have an editing phase. You will be able to sort through the good and the bad. But if you don't do the work to get all the ideas out and, and, and in front of yourself for easy picking, then you won't have them later at your fingertips when you need them. Uh, the last two ideas are, uh, the last two rules are not necessarily something you guys are going to work well on right now. You're all working alone on your own projects. But as you go into the uh, working world, you're going to be working on teams. You're going to be uh, the places where you end up getting jobs. You're going to be a creative team there. And there are times when the team generates ideas together. And this is about brainstorming as a group. Rule number four, build on ideas put forth by others. So when you get together at the place where you work, and whether it's a, a film production studio or a graphic design company or an audio production facility, you guys are trying to solve an issue. People will throw out different ideas and sometimes they'll take one idea and almost repackage it and say it in a different way. And that becomes something that resonates with people. We don't want to be, we don't want to be protective of ideas. This is not a competition. When you're at a place where you work, everybody's on the same team and you're not in uh, a position where you're trying to protect my idea. If the team wins, you all win. So you want to be able to trust each other. You want to be able to brainstorm together. And when this really works at a creative company, it's, one of the great highs of working at a, at a really creative company. And that leads to rule number five, every idea and every person has equal worth. So if you're at a really creative company and you're the, like the newest guy there and you have the best idea, your idea is going to float to the top. Now, you know, the world isn't perfect and uh, a lot of the companies aren't perfect. So, you know, uh, you may have the best idea and the boss will claim credit for it. That's the way it works. But everybody in the group will know who had the good idea. And so brainstorming and a team is a chance for you to show your worth to people when you're the new guy and people respect each other. Uh, and uh, at a really creative company, rather than being jealous, rather than being protective, they all celebrate everyone having really good ideas. And uh, you know, that's uh, something that really feels good. So those are rules for brainstorming. I'm gonna want you to use them in working on the fun final plan today. But before we get to the plan, I want to talk about this week's discussion. This week's discussion is really cool. Um, it's about how do you transfer your passion? Different people are inspired by different things. Some people like movies, some people like art, some people like books, some people like music, some people like video games. Everybody likes something different. But when you find something that really speaks to you and, 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 and swells up your own passion. How do you communicate that to someone else? What are the tools that you have to sell someone else how great something is? Well, really, it's just your voice. So we're gonna work on using our voice to transfer passions. That's what this week's discussion is about. The discussion is called Emotional Storytelling, and it's uh, a little bit complicated. You want to stay with me while I explain it, but it's a really fun project. And I think you're going to find this one of the most enjoyable things you do here this month. So let me go into uh, the assignment, emotional storytelling. Uh, I hope it loads. Okay. So when I go into the assignment, you're going to see that I already have a couple of videos here. First one is a TED talk. So, um, I don't believe anybody chose this one. Sometimes people do choose this one and, uh, you know, in your, as you're coming across. But uh, if you haven't seen this one, I want, the first thing I want you to do is watch this uh, TED Talk. It's called How to Speak So That People Want to Listen by Julian Treasure. And Julian Treasure is talking about how do you have an authentic voice? How do you speak some, so that people know you're speaking from the heart? That other people can hear your words and know what you're having to say. 
So he comes up with a concept he calls HAIL. H-A-I-L stands for honesty, authenticity, integrity, and love. And that means that if you speak from the heart, if you speak with these um, uh, qualities in your voice, that other people will resonate with that. Now, that's not to say that some people can't lie and fool you, that some people aren't great actors. But for the most part, we have a terrible time lying to each other. If you're not saying something you believe in, it comes through in your voice. That's why we hate used car salesmen. Used car salesmen's jobs are to lie to us and tell us that this car is terrific when they know it's a piece of crap. And we hear that in their voice. And so we have typecast that as a thing. I know there are probably really great used cars, and we'll tell you this car is a piece of crap, but it's maybe what you can afford. But uh, that's how I would sell it anyway. But anyway, it's about speaking so that people know that you're really telling them the truth, that in your voice, they hear the authenticity. And so we want to use our voice to try to communicate that level and to come across to people so that they know uh, we are speaking the truth. And so the second concept that he comes up with is using your vocal toolbox as um, an aid to try to get this truth across. You know, sincerity is not something that you just speak, it's something you feel. So in feeling it, what do you do to try to promote that sincerity? Well, the vocal toolbox is just a simply a uh, um, a set of actions of the ways that you can use your voice to try to affect the change or not. So the second video we have here just goes through the vocal toolbox uh, item by item. But he, uh, Julian Treasure mentions them at once. And they're very simple things that, I can, uh, that we all understand. Like one is speaking fast. What happens when you speak fast? If I talk really fast, I sound excited. So if I want to sound excited, I should speak fast. If I speak slow, I sound somber and pensive. I might sound sad, but speaking slow has a different feeling, has a different connotation. And there are other things that I can do. I can have dramatic pauses. I can emphasize words. I can re do readings of my text in which you, you can almost feel the commas and paragraphs in what I have to say. You want to vary the pace. You know, if people speak in the same monotonous sing song all the time, you don't really get a sense of their emotion. But when they speak fast and slow and give certain words emphasis, then that does feel like you're speaking from the heart and that you are presenting your own truth. So these are concepts that I'm introducing for the very first time to most of you. I'm not expecting you to become experts in them. I'm expecting you to take a look, to think about it, and here is a chance to give it a try. We're in school. No one's gonna make any fun of anybody else. And all we can do is start to use these tools and get better and better and better at them. Through the 30 months you're gonna be here at school, if you constantly are using your vocal toolbox, you will become better and better at talking in ways that be, are accessible and believable to others. And that's all we ask. We're not asking anybody to become a master. We're asking people to take the first step. So that's what we're talking about. So we want you to speak with your voice. That's the main thing that is different about this week's discussion. The first post you're gonna make is not a text post. You're going to post, uh, your audio. So let's look at the instruction sheet. Here's the instruction sheet right here. You want to download this PDF and this PDF will talk to us and tell us, you know, that we, what we want you to do. And the assignment is using the vocal toolbox and concepts of hail, tell your audience a story centered around a piece of media that resonates with you. This can be a song, a movie, video game, painting, a sculpture, a book. The options are endless. Connect with your instructor if you need assistance. So it's any piece of media. I used to say people, I used to say work of art and then people would always think that they had to talk about Van Gogh. 
work of art can have a wide generation of meaning, but any piece of media. And we have an awful lot of folks here that aren't even necessarily in the media arts. We have some folks here that want to become sportscasters. Well, uh, it's any experience of a great event. So there might be games that you've seen in your life, a particular Super Bowl game or a particular game of the World Series that you'll always remember. And that's something that resonates with you. We want you to pick some item. And, and again, I, I heard from so many people this week that were couldn't pick among the, the, uh, the, the three TED Talks because you couldn't choose. Don't get caught in a, um, uh, a freeze of not being able to choose. This doesn't have to be the very best. It just has to be something that you can talk about. So choose a story, choose a piece of media that gives you a chance to tell a story. Something that had an effect on you. A song that, was, that will always be your song because that's the song that was playing when you fell in love. Or a video game that taught you the meaning of how to get along with others or got you through uh, some time when you were sick or something like this. The media that you choose is up to you, but it has to be your own personal interconnection. I'm not asking you to become a reviewer here and telling me how great the book is or how great the movie is. I'm asking you to tell me what is your personal connection to it? What is the meaning of this thing to you? That's the story. So I want you to tell me a two to three minute story about your encounter with this piece of media and how it gave meaning to you. And I want you to pass that meaning along to us to make us want to watch that movie, hear that song, play that video game. So you're going to tell that story. There's a couple of prompts here. Now, a lot of PMs, people, when they see these prompts, they think you have to answer every single one of these questions. These are just, for instance, they're helpful. You have to figure out your own way into telling stories. So, you know, don't feel like these are necessary responses you have to have. You're going to tell your own story about what the media means to you. The first thing to do is to figure out what piece of media you want to talk about. And that should probably directly relate to the anecdote of the time that you felt it. And so what you're going to post in your initial post in the discussion board is what we're calling an audiovisual project. Meaning that it can have video, but it has to have audio. So you can post audio only, or you can post a video of yourself talking. So, uh, or you can post presentation. So we're giving you a lot of options here. The only thing that's absolutely required is that you post your audio talking. It has to be two to three minutes long, remember? And we're going to give you till Friday to put it up. So we're going to give you a little bit of extra time. Uh, the earlier you put it up, the more other people will give you commentary. And the first people who comment, uh, the first people who post usually get lots of really great commentary from their classmates. But uh, there's also a uh, requirement that you respond to two or more classmates. So once everyone gets all their, their uh, initial posts up, you want to come back and make text replies. And there are two different types of replies that you can make. You can talk to people about how well they use your voice, whether they use their, tel their, their tool, vocal toolbox in one way or another, or you can talk to them about the game that they chose or the, you know, the media that they chose. If you talk about the Harry Potter books and, and uh, you're, you're a Harry Potter fan, you can connect on that level. If someone you know, gave, put in Final Fantasy VII and that's your favorite game too, talk, you can talk about the choice of media or you can talk about uh, using the mobile toolbox. Those are both relevant things to talk about, but I want you to give good, interesting responses and I want you to be as lively as possible. But back to the original here, you're gonna create an audio visual project and you're gonna post it in the discussion board. Now, I don't know if you guys were really all that noticeable the first time around, but our discussion board has the ability to have media in it. And I have put a couple of examples in the discussion board for everybody. So I wanna go through those real briefly right now. And most of you have video cams. So I'm going to say that the easiest way to complete this project is just to sit down in front of your video cam and um, talk into it and tell your story. And you can create a video from that and you can then post it directly onto um, our 
our discussion board, or you can post it to YouTube and link the YouTube link into here. So the first thing I'm going to show you is that this is a web video that Andy did about um, the first Superman movie. And it is, he posted it to, super, uh, to, to YouTube. So we cross-linked it over here. And, and when we cross-link like this, you can see the familiar YouTube interface tools available to us. So I'm going to play this for you right now. I'm not going to play you the whole thing, but I'm going to play you enough to get you started and see, let you see what it looks like. So Superman the movie. Uh, that movie was made in, or was released in 1978. I think the first time that I actually sat down and watched that movie uh, had to have been like five or six years old in that time area. Now, aside from things like great acting and performances and casting, amazing technological leaps and bounds and filmmaking, having basically three separate movies in one single movie, aside from those things that I, that I would generally say are reasons why it's my favorite movie, the reason that I feel such an emotional connection to it um, goes back to my dad. When I was little, when I was that little, uh, my dad was in the Navy and he was away overseas on deployment for long, for really long periods of time. And so unfortunately it was during those sort of formative years in my life, in my childhood, that my dad wasn't there. He wasn't around. Um, so I was sort of lacking that father figure role model. I guess I sort of found that through this movie, um, and through the character of Clark Kent. All right, now, uh, this is in the discussion board, so you guys can watch the whole thing later. I just wanted to get you set up here and show you what this looks like. So this is Andy just standing in front of his computer with the webcam on running and talking straight into it. Now, the webcam is fixed on the computer, so the camera doesn't move, and he gets to walk around. He gets to use his hand gestures and, and uh, vocal uh, facial expressions as well as use his voice. Now, when you use a webcam, you're responsible for everything the camera sees. So he's got pretty much a clear, clean background here. He doesn't have a lot of extraneous stuff. If you're gonna use a webcam, make sure the shot doesn't have a lot of distracting other information in it so we can focus in on you. Now, you'll also notice that Andy, who has got some video editing chops, basically went in and cut in a lot of stills from the movie. I'm happy for you to do this, but you don't have to. Don't feel obligated to do this. Only do this if you know how. I don't want anybody working above their own skill level or feeling like you have to show off. I'm happy for you just to give me a solid video camera uh, anecdote without any overlays. If you want to do that, only do it if you know how and you feel comfortable doing it. Uh, otherwise, just the single video shot loaded up. And again, you can either load it to YouTube and link it across, or you can embed it straight into um, the thing here with video. If, when you make your post and you uh, introduce the, uh, uh, your, your thing, we have a number of different ways for you to embed them. So if you create an, an audio only file, if it's MPEG-3 audio, we can make it stream directly onto the here. So if I click this, becomes a drag and drop panel that you can drop MPEG threes on. If I click this, this takes MPEG four only. So no AVIs, no WMVs, no MOVs. But if it's an MPEG four video, you can drag and drop it in here and that video will load directly to our website and run directly off our website. Now there's a 500 megabyte limit on that. So if your main is really huge, then I recommend that you put it on YouTube. And if it's on YouTube, then you can embed it. There's, uh, you take the embed code from the YouTube and you put it in here and that's how you get this uh, play across. Anybody that's having trouble doing any of that, you can just attach the file, drag and drop, and I will help you um, uh, get it loaded. And then additionally, you can put in individual pictures as well. So you can put in a picture. So. Uh, here's an example of MPEG-3 audio, and uh, this is uh, a fellow Jim telling us about a song by Bruce Springsteen that had a huge effect on him, and he recorded this uh, just as an audio file, so it plays in line like this. I remember getting to work a little late that day. I don't remember why I was late. Maybe I had an errand to take care of on the way to work, or I was just running behind. My office was on the top floor of a six-story building, 
So I took the elevator up and walked off onto a floor which should have been loud and bustling on a Tuesday morning at nine o'clock. The first thing I noticed though was that it was eerily quiet. And just about everyone was gathered over in the corner, staring up at TV monitors that usually showed business news and stock quotes on repeat. I saw one of my friends towards the back of the crowd and I asked him what was going on. I hadn't listened to the radio on the way to work and I hadn't seen the TV that morning at all. He said to me, two planes crashed into the World Trade Center this morning, not looking away from the TV monitor, which I just noticed showed two familiar buildings with black smoke pouring out of them. Now, he, hasn't, he doesn't start off talking about the song. He starts off talking about a memory that he had. And if you're of a certain age, um, what, what you were doing when 9-11 happened is something that all of us will have a memory of. We, we all have the ability to tell each other, this is what I was doing when I, when I first heard this. This has such a shocking news that all of us suddenly remember at that point. And if you go back even further in history, uh, a lot of people will be able to tell you uh, from the 60s what they were doing when they first heard that John F. Kennedy got shot as well. I'm too young for John F. Kennedy. Some of you are too young for 9-11, but these are searing events that most people remember immediately. And so Jim needed to tell us that because when he first heard this Bruce Springsteen song, which is about firefighters in the World Trade Towers uh, dying heroically, first time he heard that song, he had a powerful image of deja vu that took him back to that moment. And so this is his way of telling the story. And I'm mentioning that because I want to say that there are many, many ways to tell a story. You might introduce your choice right up front. You might have to explain things before you get to your point. So we will all find our own different ways to this. But if you choose an audio only uh, presentation, uh, you can record that both on your phone or with the, uh, the uh, microphone and your computer. And uh, so I will give you good uh, options for doing that with either. And in terms of the, uh, the webcam, if you're on a phone, if your phone is your only media here, you can do the very same thing. You can actually create the vertical videos. Uh, those of you that are gonna use your phone, the one thing I will absolutely mention is that you need to lock down the phone. Don't be holding it in your hand. Your hand is gonna move around and that's gonna create uh, a janky moving video and that never looks good. So you need to lock down your video, lock down your, your camera when you shoot. But um, there are a number of ways to do that. And there are a number of ways of finding good uh, spaces to yourself. I know a lot of you have roommates or you live in uh, work in different situations where it's really hard to isolate. Some people end up recording in the bathroom because they can, they can uh, you know, control the sound there. Some people like to go into their closets. If you're in your closet and all there's all of these coats and blankets and things in there, you get a nice muffled sound. And another place where people can control the audio environment is your car. If you're in your car by yourself, now obviously you won't be doing any of this while you're driving, but if you're sitting in your car by yourself, then that is an audio environment that you can control. And if you have your phone, you can lock it up against the steering wheel and you can do a pretty uh, quick job of telling your story and getting a good video recording. And then you can upload it directly to the discussion board. Uh, and there are presentation tools that we can use. Some of you might want to use PowerPoint and PowerPoint is going to be fine. Only PowerPoint will not play in line in our discussion board. So if you create a PowerPoint, you just will come up here and you put it in the drop and drag section and people will download it and watch it offline and come back and comment, which is not the greatest, but it works. So if, if you wanna use PowerPoint, please feel free. If you wanna use a presentation tool that does work well, we recommend something called Adobe Spark. We've linked to it here. We've also have a link to it in the, in the instructions here. So uh, you will find that Adobe Spark is linked to in the instruction, instructions. And it's a website from Adobe, the people who make the Creative Cloud uh, tools that allows you to make presentations really quickly and easily. And they make three different types, the social graphic, which is a, 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 a single image, a web page, and short videos. You wanna make a short video, that's the equivalent of a presentation. But they make them for free and they allow you to export them from their website 
So we're pretty happy with the uh, effect that people get. And here's an example of someone using Adobe Spark to create uh, a presentation. And they're talking about their favorite movie. And again, in order to do that, they have to set it up a little bit. So I'm gonna play a little bit of this and you can see how um, uh, Adobe Spark works and get a pretty good sense of what you can do with that. I think we all can agree that middle school is pretty awkward. It's filled with awkward preteens and their awkward bodies navigating their awkward social cliques. But despite all of that awkwardness, it's in these fragile middle school years that children really begin to piece together who they are and what they care about. It's in middle school where self-esteem seems to be teetering on a tightrope, waiting for a strong gust of wind to push it to one side or the other. And this issue of self-esteem was no different for me. It was in middle school that I realized that I did not fit in with the other girls in my class. I was all about basketball while they were all about nail polish. I hated skirts, but they were all into skirts. The effort that it takes to put on makeup depresses me, but the time crunch never seemed to bother the other girls in my grade. I knew that the things that my peers were turning to was not authentic to me, but I still felt the pressure to conform. I was a tomboy, and in many ways I still am and in middle school that can be difficult to grapple with. I didn't fit into the socially constructed definition of a girl. I never got the guy, I never dressed up, I hate wearing heels. But one thing I did know was that I was in love with the game of basketball. It was in the seventh grade when I first saw what would become my all time favorite movie, Love and Basketball. It was finally a movie for the tomboy. A movie so again, I'll let you watch the whole presentation, but she needed to explain who she was before she could get to her choice of media. And that's just to say, there are lots of ways to tell a story and you will find your own way into the story. But again, it's all about being authentic and transferring the passion you have for one thing to others. And that's what we're working on this week. So first you have to pick the media that you wanna talk about and figure out the story that you wanna tell. And then you have to figure out a way into that story, how to put it together. Uh, I decided to do one myself. So I chose a movie. Uh, this is probably an older classic movie you haven't heard of. It's a John Wayne movie called The Quiet Man. So I did an audio only presentation, but I also used the image feature to put in a movie poster here so you can get a little bit of information about the movie. So, uh, you know, I have a review of The Quiet Man. It's just another example that you have, but there are different ways to tell your story. So uh, I'm happy for you guys to all uh, you know, use any medium that works, use any tools that work, and get a hold of me and, and uh, ask questions. Um, if you want to create audio on your laptop, uh, there's a, a free source tool we call Audacity. I'll talk about it a little more little next week, but we recommend that for creating audio. Um, and those of you that have iPads or different gear, uh, you know, there, there are lots of different choices for making things, but um, uh, you just work with the gear that you have. If you do not know what choices to use, get a hold of us and we will try to give you as much information as we can. But um, try to get these posted by Friday, even earlier if you can, and then uh, you have until Sunday to comment on what everyone's written. And uh, these are usually some of the most interesting um, presentations we've seen. And uh, this is not the main presentation. This is just something we're doing for the discussion. It's two to three minutes long. Once you figure it out and get it done, you know, use minimal tech um, and, and uh, spread your ideas, spread your passion. If you're curious about, you know, which media to choose or, how to tell your story, get a hold of me. I want to be able to help everybody. So that brings us to um, uh, the main assignment for the week, planning a presentation. So if you go to the instructions for planning a presentation, uh, one of the things that's slightly missing is the topic. Um, it's up to me to explain it to you. It's in the header right here. And it's called your plan to pitch yourself to a future employer. And that's what the topic is. It's called your brand. And what you're supposed to do is to imagine that whatever you came to full sail to study, that you have graduated. Imagine that you've gotten all the way through school. So it's 
three or four years from now, two or three years from now, and you have a chance to go for the dream job you've always wanted to work for. So the first thing you have to figure out is who do you want to work for? Who is the company that if you gained all the skills that you've come full sale to learn, and maybe you need to go beyond full sale, you know, this is an act of imagination, but if you came to full sale, gathered all the knowledge that was here, who do you want to work for? Do you want to animate for Pixar? Do you want to do programming for Google? Do you want to um, do advertising for major advertising companies or sports companies? What did you come here to full sale to do and who would you ideally like to work for? So the first job you have is to figure out who your audience is. Your audience is the company that you want to hire you. The idea is that you've got this golden opportunity. It could be right upon graduation. It may be a couple of years past graduation. You may have to decide that you're going to take a few other jobs before you're ready to go for your dream job. But whatever it is, you have to figure out what your dream job is. And the presentation you're going to create is a three to four minute presentation talking directly to the company. You're not talking to me. You're not talking to your full students. You're making a presentation between you and that company. And so part of what you have to do this week is some research. If you decide that you would like to work for Pixar, who is the person at Pixar you might be talking to? Or what is some of the information you might need to know about them? You're going to research your audience so you know how to reach them. Maybe you already know about the company or audience. Maybe you want to record for Interscope Records and you know everything about Interscope Records. That's great. Then in the plan, I just want you to tell me, you know, what you know about the company. So the plan is a text document. Um, you, you can do anything you want. We're going to give you a lot of freedom here. Just like in terms of brainstorming, you can write a sketch or do a storyboard or whatnot. Most people will end up writing a Word doc in Word. If you want to use PowerPoint for this, it's okay. It doesn't matter. But it's however you want to gather your ideas. And these items here on the second page of the instructions are the things that you have to have in your plan. You have to identify your target audience, meaning you're telling me who is the employer that you want to speak to and address. And I wanted you to tell me what you know about them. Now, in researching them, that's not to say that that's what goes into your presentation. You don't need to tell Disney what Disney's all about. I just need you to know that you know what Disney's all about so that you can talk to them in a credible way. What is your big idea? What is your brand? So what is the what is the skill that you want to sell them? You want to sell them your great animation skill? Do you want to tell them your, your ideas for stories? Do you want, to, you want them to hire you as a director? Uh, what are the skills, the talents that you want to sell? And then I want you to give me your flow of ideas. I want you to tell me a story beginning, middle, and end. And this is the story of you, the story of how you gained your skills. So the beginning, how did you get started? If you're a musician, did you start playing the piano at the age of five and you were banging out tunes and you were, you were making original tunes so early that your, your, you know, your parents were considering you a prodigy and so on and so forth. And maybe you, you started playing in the church choir and you even went on the road. Then you came to full sale, gathered some skills. So the beginning is how you got started. What gave you the passion for whatever topic it is you're going to come here to study? Each of you is different. Each of you has a different dream. Each of you came here to full sale to fulfill a different passion. So you have to be honest. You have to tell me about your passion. If you tell me you don't have one, I'm going to kick your butt. The middle area is how you gained your skills. Now, this is about full sale, but it's not only about full sale. You obviously gathered skills before you came to full sale. You obviously had uh, encounters with uh, other things. Maybe you went into the army for a period of time and that developed who you are. 
Maybe you had a second career. Maybe you, you worked for 10 years and decided that that's not who you were, but it is part of who you are. It's part of the story of who you are. So the middle is how you became qualified, how you got your skills. And obviously you need to talk about full sale. And you're gonna talk about full sale in the past tense. You're gonna pretend that you already graduated. So I want you to mention a class or two and talk about what it meant to you. Now, I know you haven't taken that class yet, but it's incumbent upon everybody to look at your schedule and look at the classes and say, this is the class that's gonna have you know, a meaningful impact on me. And you could be making all this up right now, that's fine, but it's a meaningful act of projection. So anybody who doesn't know how to get a hold of their uh, curriculum, we've got uh, a video about how to, how to access your curriculum on the Full Sail EDU website uh, in the announcements. So if you look in the announcements, it's pretty easy. You go to Full Sail EDU. On the front page are the different career guides. You find the program that you're in. You go to that page, and somewhere near the bottom will be a listing of all the classes that you're going to be taking for the next 30 months. So that's all there. You have the chance to see that. And I want everybody to look at that and know that. And I don't want you to just list 20 classes that you took. I want you to pick one or two. You know, I, I, I studied world building and this helped me build, you know, uh, 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 planets and, 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 and civilizations and so forth. Um, so middle part is how you gained your skills. And I don't want you to spend a ton of time praising full sale. I want you to spend a lot of time talking about what you learned and why and what vision it gave you for what you want to do. And I want you to talk about your portfolio projects. You haven't done them yet, but between now and the time that you meet your dream employer, you will have created portfolio work. So I want you to talk about it. I want you to talk about it as if you've done it. I want you to own it in your head. And finally, the end, the call to action. I want you to stand there Talk to your dream employer, say, I know who you are. I understand the company. Uh, Blizzard has made all the games I love in life. You guys are a culture that I, I really believe in. I think I can contribute. I think you guys really can use my skills. Let's get together. I want you to stand in front of your dream employer and make that ask, a call to action. I want you to ask them to take you on. I want to hear it out of your voice. That's part of the visualization that's going on in here. So that's the presentation you're gonna make. It's three to four minutes long. You're not making it this week. You're making a plan. You're making a document that has, what are all the elements here? So as you tell your story, three to four minutes long, this is where the brainstorming happens. These are the elements that you're gonna put in about who you are and what you studied and what you've done and what you believe and what your projects are and maybe even a little bit about life after full sale. It's up to you how far you want to go uh, at, uh, beyond to when you're actually addressing your dream employer. And then you also have, what will your star moment be? So we've, we've talked about star moments last week uh, in, in terms of, uh, you know, the things that you can put in your presentations. So what are you going to do? Are you going to show off some of your songs? Are you going to show a, a game that you made? Uh, with classmates here at Full Sail. Uh, you're going to have uh, some websites that you designed. You know, what is the portfolio material that you can put together? So these are all ideas that I want you to put into a document. And that document is due on Sunday. Now, as with last week, uh, I'm happy to share examples of what other students have done. This is much more far afield because people have a lot of freedom in the way that they can work. But uh, let's take a, a look at this. A lot of people use Word and they use it in an outline fashion. So here's somebody who wants to work for Blizzard and they have all the different points here and they're making different bullet points. So I have a lot of information and it's the information that I'm asking for. And they've even added some, in, some, some, some stills here. So they're already doing the job of collecting some artwork to go into the slides. You don't have to do that but that is a good thing to go ahead and start doing. So again, uh, an outline format, we have target audience, true message, beginning, middle, end, the takeaway, and so forth. So 
These are all ideas. They're separate bullet points, but they fit together. Um, now, there are a lot of different ways to do this. Uh, some people like to write in paragraph or fashion. So instead of bullet points, you just basically take each topic. Who is your target audience? What is your true message? What is your big idea? What is the beginning, et cetera? And, the, and uh, you know, if you, if you like to write like that, then that's fine. Uh, another thing that people do is um, uh, I have a guy that, that used post-it notes. He put post-it notes on the wall. And once he got them all put together, we have everything we asked for here. Here is his audience. Here's the delivery method. Here's the beginning, middle, and end. Here's the tools he's going to use. He's talking about his brand. Now, in terms of giving me your handwriting, I'm happy for you to share me, for you to share pages out of your notebook or do things that are handwritten. But the rule is, if you think possibly I can't read your writing, then absolutely I can't read your writing and I want you to type it. But if I can read your writing, then you can turn in something that's free form. So he put post-it notes on the wall. He took a good, clean, well-lit photograph. I can read everything that's being said here. So I don't have a problem with this because I, it's all legible. So I'm, I'm gonna be as open in terms of you turning in odd formats as I can be. Bottom line is you guys have to turn me in something that's legible. Now, in terms of mind maps, this is an example of a mind map. It are basically visual uh, representations of a, a text outline. So the very same things are here. Uh, here we have the target audience, the future self, the true message, the beginning, middle, and end, a star moment. So all the different elements, but this person thinks a little more, a little more visually. So he used a mind mapping tool. And if you're interested in mind mapping tools, if they seem like something that might help you to be visually creative, uh, in the announcements, we've got the links to some mind mapping tools that you might use. So you might wanna try around with that if you've never heard of it, but it seems like this is a, a visual tool that might be useful to you. There are a number of different ones that you can try and uh, uh, we've made a link in the announcements for you to do with that. But I have a number of different presentations here that people have given me and I'm happy to share them. So uh, as last, last week, send me a message asking for a presentation and ask for a particular type. If you're interested in mind maps, ask for that. If you're interested in outlines, write for that. If you're interested in uh, you know essay type S answers, write for that because the type of thing that you wanna do, I wanna give you an example of what someone else did. And really there's no problem with sharing as many of these as I like because their dream is never gonna be your dream. You have to have your own target audience. You have to have your own, uh, you know, story of, of your own life that you have to tell. But that's what this week's presentation plan is. You are creating the elements that next week you're gonna make a presentation out of. So these raw elements will eventually become a script on your part. And a, um, um, a little suggestion about script. Um, We've discovered that one page double spaced, if you read it out loud, is about a minute. So if you wanna to try to control for time, which is a good idea, I've asked you to make a presentation that's three to four minutes long. Some people start talking and before they know it, they've made something that's 25 minutes long and they just can't help themselves. Well, you wanna control that. Uh, the closer you get to three to four minutes, the better off you are. And one way to control that is to write your script ahead of time. And since we know that one page double spaced is about a minute read out loud, then you're trying to create three to four pages double spaced and therefore you'll fit right into that target zone. And a lot of you have a lot of your story that you wanna tell and you're gonna run long. And, and, and that's fine. Tell the story that you need to run. Don't feel uh, crazy about running a little bit long. But know that once you've done that, we're gonna want you to try to edit it back. Now, the very first presentation, week three, is called the first draft. Because you're gonna get feedback from me and you're gonna get feedback from your own self. And in week four, you're gonna get a chance to revise it. So if you run long in week three, then you'll know that in week four, you wanna to try to 
get a little bit closer to that target zone. We want to make a presentation that's three to four minutes long. It's going to contain a voiceover and it's going to contain slides by you. It can be a video, it can be a PowerPoint, it can be Adobe Spark. We're going to give you lots of options for how to use software. But for now, all I want you to do is think about the elements of your story that you have to tell. Figure out the audience, the dream job that you want to go for, and then figure out the other elements of what needs to be in there. And I'm sure with that, I've created a ton of questions. So let's start having some questions. Anybody who wants to uh, ask me a question, just raise your hand, uh, or indicate it, and I'll unmute your mic. Anybody who wants to type it in the chat box, we can do it that way, it's fine. Uh, Paula, if I, Am I supposed to see your message? Oh. Paula, I'm going to unmute you because I don't understand what you've written in the chat. Paula, can you? I was asking about the Discord because um they were saying that we have to go there for um class something. Discord is optional. Uh, if you use Discord, I think that a lot of people are getting getting a lot of use out of it. Uh, but again, it's just trying to be helpful to what people already do. Yes. Uh, you, you'll find that if you go where there are other people, that you're, it's always nice to have help. Yes. So that's true. I, I've found that because there's a, a fairly active group of people using Discord this month already, that it might be something for you to try just because you're always going to find other people that can give you help. And I've noticed that the people who are working in Discord this month are really great people helping each other out, uh, you know, become good classmates and cohorts to each other. And they're helping each other, you know, do better work. So uh, if you'd like that kind of help, then certainly seek them out. Uh, and I have posted links to get into Discord. Uh, if you need uh, me to post it again, I can do that. Thanks. So anybody got a question about the assignments? Um, I can let you go. Um, I have a question. Sure. So just to have an understanding, the emotional storytelling, that's the one with the audio and video. And then the other one, um, planning a presentation, we don't have to do any type of like um, video assignment no, no, no. or anything like that. This is purely a written assignment. OK. And if you've noticed in some of the examples, some people collected some images. I'm not mm -hmm. even asking for that. You can if you wish, but it's really just the answer these questions. Tell me target audience, beginning, middle, end. So these are all text. So okay. it's going to be a text file that you turn in. That's the plan. And from that plan, you're going to make multimedia next week. But this week, your media is, is in the discussion board, which is the audio piece. Okay. And one more question, not sure. um, anything that does with this assignment, but last week's assignment or the one that's due on Wednesday, we're comparing our presenters or are we um, sharing? Because I thought the assignment, we're comparing like what we like different from each presenter for the TED well, Talk. Well, there's two parts to it. You're writing a review, like two paragraphs on each individual one. And for that, you're looking at it by itself. You're just saying, this person did that, and I like this about it, and you know, this happened, and, and, and you're just really telling me how the performer did his or her job. Mm -hmm. And then that list at the end, it's a single list of 10 qualities, and it's things that you noticed in common that they all did. So you're making generalizations at this point. Oh, OK, then. So, so you, know, you, you, you might be talking in your first, pres first review, and then you say, Presenter opened up by telling a joke, and that's what that person did in that review. And then when you come down to the list of qualities, you might have noticed that they all used humor. So you would say, you know, quality number one, all of them used humor. So one is a specific observation, and the other is a bit of a generalization. You're comparing three together. Oh, okay. I'm doing the assignment wrong. <laughs> okay, then. All right. Well, okay. uh, again, if you, if you are, then ask for a sample, because I think that... Uh, 
looking at, at what previous students turned in can, can really help you to understand what we're talking about. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, we have anybody else ask questions? Uh, Megan says, I don't necessarily have a question. I am foreseeing the mind block I'm going to run into that being, how do you sell yourself to a future employer, not knowing things that you currently know about, nothing about? Well, <laughs> that gets down to why am I doing this assignment? And uh, I'm happy to talk about that. And that is that while it seems maybe silly, this is a very vital act of visualization. You know, you're going to go on a long, hard path 30 months to become this person that can stand in front of Disney and, you know, get hired. And in order for you to become that person, you have to have some sort of notion or vision of who that person is. So when you say, how can I be somebody that I'm not when I don't know who I am, you're talking about the person you wanna become. And you obviously have some ambitions, you obviously have some notion of the talent that you want to acquire. Uh, that's what you came here to full self to get. And you know, be as confident as possible. Say, full sail taught me everything I needed to know and that I became this person. I don't want you to indulge in some wild fantasy and talk about Oscars that you won and you know, your latest project with Jay-Z. I want you to be realistic. But in gaining skills, what does that lead you on to? What does that give you license to do? What are ideas for novels or movies or game up games that you want to create that you have in your head? What are songs that you want to do? Uh, you know, you obviously came to full sail to fulfill a dream. And I want you to kind of push those dreams and just make it as real in your head as possible. And that's what this presentation is about. It's creating a blueprint for the person that you will become. And uh, magically enough, if you think about that person and you, have it as the vision at the end of a tunnel, you'll be headed in the right direction. You won't necessarily become that person. The path is, is too torturous, there's too many different turns, but you'll be headed in the right direction. You will become somebody that you hope to be and admire. Uh, anybody else have questions? Well, I know you're going to have questions. I know you're going to feel, you know, at some point this week, whether you're working on the discussion board or, or the, the plan, I'm not sure I know what I need to do. Well, I'm around. And I'm here to ask, answer questions, and I'm happy to answer those questions. So I want everybody to, you know, feel good about this and have fun. This is a really challenging, fun week for you guys. I want you to, you know, really enjoy it because, you know, that's why you're here at school. You're here to be creative, and I'm asking you, be creative. So bon appetit. Good night, guys.